All right. Well, um, I am going to kick it off now that it is 10 o'clock on the dot. I want to welcome you guys out, uh, all those who are joining uh, to another Land Effects webinar. We have a special guest presentation today from Amiad. We have Ron with us, and uh, I am Jake, by the way. Uh, I will be moderating this webinar. So uh, before we get really kicked off here, want to just remind everybody watching live that this is live. We love questions. We love comments. We love the banter back and forth. So use that Q&A box there for your questions. We can try to get those answered um, when we've got time. Um, I'll shoot those over to Ron as well. And if you got any other comments and, and different things that you just want to chat back and forth with, that is what the chat box is for. Um, this is being recorded and will be posted up onto our website later today. So if you want to watch this again, because it's going to be so thrilling, then uh, that's where you're going to find that. So without any further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Ron. Awesome, Jake. Thank you very much. I appreciate this opportunity to be able to share this. And uh, I'll click here and make sure we're seeing the screen and everything's good to go. Um, as Jake said, I'm with Amiad uh, Water Systems. We've uh, been around for a lot of years and doing a lot of water filtration. And so today we're going to talk about filter selection and sizing guidelines. Um, our last presentation we did, we talked about filtration and kind of how it works and some of the ins and outs, but this time we're going to dive in a little deeper and uh, go into how we are thinking process and how we go about checking and, and building a system properly. So um, again, uh, my name is Ron Krause. I've uh, been in the irrigation world for a lot of years, uh, about 35 years of my life I've spent in the irrigation world. Um, and I'm certified as a CLIA and I've been with Amiad for about a year and a half. So as a, a regional sales manager. So we have here, um, basically our agenda, we're gonna talk about our, our state of mind, um, our, our basically what we're trying to do is our thinking process and how we want to adapt to filtration in our projects. And we're gonna give a couple of case studies and then we'll talk about some of the summary. We'll go over a little bit of summary. Again, save your questions for the end. Uh, we'll leave some time for that and we'll uh, go through a lot of different details on that end. So, all right. So we're gonna start out with um, think in your mind. You don't have to answer out loud or anything, um, but this is kind of a perspective uh, dialogue here. What do you see? Well, surprisingly, this is actually a pencil. <laughs> I got another one here. A, a cigarette. Um, I got one here for some of those engineers or logical thinkers. Many of you might know this one. It's a crescent wrench. So the purpose of that is really, you know, what are we looking for when we're starting a project? What are we diving into? And our point is, is we want you to see the bigger picture. We want us to think about the bigger picture, what are, we're trying to accomplish with filtration and how we want to accomplish that in the long run. So where do we start? Well, it's, you know, there's a lot to go about with uh, filtration and with an irrigation system in general and designing it. And so we want to start right at the beginning but thinking about that bigger picture. Do we start with the screen? Do we start with the technology? Do we start with the type of product we want to put in the ground? Or do we start with the filters, all the different varieties of filters that we could put in the ground or put as part of the project? We want to say no. We don't start anywhere with any of these things. We want to start with the thinking process and this thinking process is we want to recognize the pain, diagnosis, technology choice, and sizing. And by we're going to go through each of these individually and kind of talk about what it means to recognize the pain. 
Well, recognizing the pain, what is the business problem or what is the filtration or irrigation problem that we're dealing with? Uh, if you're dealing with a site that's uh, about recycled water or canal water or various types of water, we wanna look at all of those different aspects so that we can recognize the biggest challenge that we have. So some of these pains could be regulation. They could be manpower. We don't have enough manpower. We, know, uh, we don't have enough ability, consumables. Uh, the production downtime could be a problem and our product quality, meaning our result, our crops, uh, which in the landscape is our grass, our plants, our shrubs, all those different things. So once we kind of recognize the problem and we understand what the pain is, we want to take and diagnose that problem. And this is where we get into the applications. Like this is where we start talking about what kind of product we want to put in, what kind of, uh, how we want to, our end result needs to be. Um, and this is where we talk about success criteria, what we need to see in that success solution. This is where we talk about water data and our site and our end user. So this, uh, it, it's interesting to get into the dynamics of how particle size distribution works. And this is where you get out of a report if you do a water analysis um, and you wanna understand what we're filtering to. And so we wanna understand how we use these charts and how we would function with these charts. We're looking for the higher percentiles of, in the volume distribution and, and the particle sizing. And so that's why you see down in the bottom right, those things are highlighted to show us that those are our volume percentages that we need to look towards and filter towards. Again, we're trying to run these through charts so that we can see what we're trying to filter out and, and keep in our parameters for our filtration. A lot of this for us is, is determined by our emission devices um, and what we're trying to filter down to. So if you look at these, these, you know, we're trying to demonstrate here that all the particles that are greater than a two micron are based on a volumetric test, the median particle size was around 10 micron. So that's basically where we try and find what our filtration should be based on. So all that is a lot of, you know, high tech talk and uh, variations that kind of go into a big formula that I think is probably something more than we really need to think about. Our peripherals here is, you know, we're looking at our hydraulic parameters, meaning like what's our pressure available? What's our flows available? Uh, available footprint, like do we have a big enough space to put a decent sized filter or what we have to deal with on that? Uh, we have to look at our upstream and downstream process, meaning how, how are we pumping the water in? How is it being inlet and outlet into our system at our POC? And we also have to look at our backwash, our source, where we're going to drain it to, and also how we're going to drain that and our throttling of that drain so that it can actually have the back pressure. Our other site conditions are ambient temperature, power supply, compressed air if we're doing uh, different types of filtrations. So those are things we have to consider when we're diagnosing a system. And then we also have to think about what the end user's type and environment is. You know, is it a remote location? Uh, is it somewhere operators can get to and operate on and work and deal with? Uh, we also have to think about our operators' qualifications, what we're gonna see in the field and, and if they have the technology to be able to manage a certain system, the expected lifetime of the system, and other special design standards that we have to deal with in terms of uh, regulations and requirements. So now we've kind of gone through diagnosing the problem and, and putting together a plan or a thought process of what all those different things are. We need to kind of go through now, we start talking about our technology of choice, what, what we wanna use, how we wanna use. 
And we need to look at the strong points and the limitations in filtration, which all filtration has its strong points and all filtration has its limitations as to what it can achieve and what it can do for us. This is where we start talking about our different types of technologies. Our disc technology, our screen technology, microfiber, media, and screen because that's stuff we're gonna see in our uh, realm more. So we have to look at all the different types of parameters that these types of filters have. So we're gonna narrow down a little bit on the screen technology. If we look at it, we have the ability to have a small footprint. They can handle high temperature. They can handle high pressure in some cases. A lot of them are coated, coated welded alloys or polymeric. So we have to kind of consider the water quality and what we're dealing with. And we can go down to 10 micron on those. So some of the limitations that we have to deal with and think about is a low backwash flow rate. And it has, um, it has this typical high fiber and TSS loads. So we have to think about that in terms of limitations for the screens. Now, if we jump over to microfiber, which we probably won't deal with in the landscape a lot, but uh, it has a polis application, coated welded alloy, and it's down to two microns. So it's even more filtration, probably more than we would need in the landscape. But I'm just using these as examples for us to understand what the limitations are and the, the uh, strong points of these different types of filters are. So we have pressurized external backwash source that we have to require on a microfiber. So that's its limitations. So we've kind of gone through the technology and how we would look at that technology and what we would do uh, in terms of diving into the strong points and the limitations. And we would utilize that to, in order to help us make valid solution recommendations for a project. And normally, if you deal with an AMIA representative, they're gonna give you multiple solutions for the same problem because there is multiple solutions that can be used on the same problem. And one might choose one way and the other might choose another on, a different, on two different projects that are identical but the outcome is still gonna be very similar based on that. So now we talk about the sizing and uh, as per the guidelines and other factors that we deal with. So again, this is another um, chart that we would look at in terms of sizing the right filter. And we use the water quality in order to size this. So you have your good, average, poor, and very poor water quality. The reason we need this is in order to determine what kind of filter we want to put on the system will help us to determine what size uh, screen, what size inlet and outlet, what the flow can be, because as water quality goes down, our flow rates, our max flow rates through filters changes a bit. It actually goes down a little bit uh, because we can only handle so much of that poor water quality before the flush mechanism has to kick in and do its job. So those are things to consider when you're thinking about um, sizing a filter. Again, as we talk about that, we're looking at a chart here that shows all the good, average, poor, and very poor uh, water quality and the micron degrees. Now, when we get into micron degrees, we start talking about the, the element, the, fi the filter element. And when we start looking at that, we have to take into consideration the flow what it will handle in that system. So for example, if we have a 40 micron system and the filter velocity is at 200, our GPM on the inches, the square inches of the filter element is at 0.57, that'll give us our calculation to how much uh, max flow we can run through that system, which will help determine if that filter will handle that amount of flow. And we may have to upsize the filter in order to manage the flow that we're going through. So same thing down here, we have a 40 micron with poor water and it's at a five and 22 GPM. So 
that kind of gets us through our whole thinking process. Now let's talk about an actual application, like a, a project that we did. Uh, it's a larger project. This project was actually a project done in uh, Michigan in the Texas Township. And here's a little background. So due to heavy snow and rainfall in the, in the prior two years to the project, the lake water levels went too high and water flooded residential property around the lake and was causing havoc. So there was a problem. The lake had no drain and therefore it was required to pump the water to a lower lake water level. Um, and unfortunately, this lake was infested with zebra mussels, which is becoming a rampant problem across the, the US. The Department of Environmental Quality in Michigan authorized pumping the water into a nearby bass lake only after filtration system was installed to prevent spreading the infestation to the neighboring properties or the neighboring lakes. So just a little background on the zebra mussel. The zebra mussel is actually a rampant infestation of a species that is hitting a lot of surface water lakes and uh, ponds throughout the nation. Once it's in the lake, it's almost nearly impossible to get out. Um, you can chemically get it out. You can, we, we've actually came up with a solution for filtration for it. And this is why we're talking about this. The, so just so you know, the, the, the zebra mussel itself is fairly easy to filter, but the larvae is actually what you have to filter in order to manage this project. So here's the client's pain. pain. The local residents are constantly exposed to the risk of flood and forced to abandon their properties. And the financial impact is obviously a loss of property. So our application is that we need to deal with the invasive species and the removal of the zebra mussels and the larvae. And it's a surface water data, or the water data, sorry, surface water. It's a particle size distribution at 50 micron. And the reason we know 50 micron is because the larvae is a, is a 50 micron size. So we know that we have to manage this system down to a 50 micron. So our success criteria, again, our selection of uh, filtration is the removal of invasive species and larvae. And we're deciding to go with a 40 micron now the flow rate is based on the pump and the mechanics of the size and of the line size and everything, which is a 1500 gallons per minute. So the end user, we're trying to develop this so that we can protect the residential. We had a little bit of characteristics in terms of the site. We had to deal with skid mounted removable uh, filtration because they couldn't leave them on site. It couldn't be built into a, a storage facility or something it had to be movable. And we had some pretty strict performance guidelines that we needed to live with. So we're now trying to decide on the technology size, what do we use? What filter do we want to use? We have two options. We could use a disc filter or we could use a screen filter. Either one of them have a very similar type of product that will give us a filtration, um, the requirements that we need. But we chose to go with the screen. And the reason we did is because the strong points outweighed the strong points on the disc. And so if we go screen first disc, the screen allowed for larger filter area, which allowed more flow and less pressure loss during uh, due to buildup. So as the filter got dirtier, the pressure loss was less than what a screen would uh, deal with. The limitations we had on this particular filter is its size, um, location, and mobility. So the filter, we actually built it on mobile skids so that we could move it from side, site to site. The sizing, this had many factors to take into consideration. Um, the pump size, inlet, outlet size, and gallons per minute. The max flow in the dirty water as well came into these decisions because as the water got dirty, we had to think about the max flow rate that we could handle. And that's why we went with a little larger filter like this. So in order to find the success of this, this is a summary. Um, we designed a custom skid mounted solution that comes with quick installation and commissioning with a reduced footprint to ensure that the filtration system can be made operational in the shortest time possible. 
The EBS uh, has a largest filtration area in the market uh, combined with a reliable electric self-cleaning mechanism and it can manage a high flow of 1500 gallons per minute in poor water quality to very fine filtration degree of 40 micron. So that's kind of a case study of, of a larger project that was more lake water. Um, we had to filter it down because the downstream lakes utilize the water for irrigation and various applications. So I have another case study I wanted to talk about and go through. And this probably will be a little bit more relevant to kind of the projects that we'll see. Um, this is a California Tejon Ranch uh, company. It's a large outlet mall slash industrial park. that's built uh, just outside of Bakersfield. Really awesome facilities. Um, and there's quite a few more development going on out here. Uh, a very large light very large commercial landscape area for each of these uh, properties. The out mall, outlet mall was a big part of it. And that was the first section that was built. And so the, you know, the client's pain was that we're trying to deal with residents' well-being and safety. It's health and aesthetics of the property at risk from lack of water due to clogging in the emission devices. So we have kind of a, a concern that as we use recycled water for these properties, that we would have an issue with our plants health. So our partial or total loss of plant life and devaluing the property could be our financial impact. Let's see here. The Sorry. So our application here, we're talking about removing suspended solids, biological matter, uh, algae, silts, debris from the system, from our point of connections. We're using reclaimed water, which we know has a total suspended solids uh, and has some debris in them. We didn't have a water analysis, but we knew that we had some water debris and, and some issues in there. Our particle size distribution is at 200 micron. And the reason we know that is because our emission devices on the downstream side were designed at a 200 micron, which is per the manufacturer's recommendations. Most of the manufacturers rec have a recommendation of micron filtration that's recommended in almost all emission devices, whether it's drip, uh, spray nozzles, um, rotary nozzles, whatever it is. And again, as we get into more precise irrigation, we're getting into more precise water filtration. Our success criteria was removing the silt, sands, debris, and algae from the system so that we didn't have a problem in our emission devices downstream. We knew that we needed to be at a 200 micron based on emission devices, drip spray, uh, which is downstream. And we also knew that we were at a 30 to 40 GPM approximately. So our end user and our site characteristics, we knew that it was commercial. Install at the point of connection. We needed to have a flush seepage pit where we could use to flush the waste, the discharged water from the filter and we needed it to be vandal protected. So now we're trying to decide between a screen filtration or a disc filtration, um, because some of the other technology that we showed earlier is a little too complex and too much for this type of system and for our end users uh, qualifications of the labor that manages and maintains the field, the landscape. We decided to go with the screen filtration. And the reason we did with the screen, again, it's a larger filter area and it allowed for more flow and less pressure loss, pressure loss due to buildup. And again, another reason was is cost. The value of this particular filter was a much better value for this particular site. Size was also another big part of it. Um, we needed something that be sized and was equitable to fit inside of a, enclosed box or a cage, as you will. So we chose to use the Mini Sigma on that particular project, which has a larger filter area. 
then they were able to utilize our, our CAD details to put them on there. Here's a picture. This is again, the sizing. Uh, this had many factors to take into consideration. We took into consideration the line size, uh, so inlet and outlet and the GPM. And then also we took into consideration the flush factor and, and meaning how much, how much pressure, how much uh, flow we needed in order to be able to still have the system flush. The other benefit to this particular filter was that it would actually allow it to flush during operation and not affect the downstream uh, pressure. So your system could be operational working and it could do a clean cycle on it without affecting downstream. The other reason we decided to go with this is because the actual controller and this particular filter required no power to it. It runs off of two or four AA batteries and manages to flush on its own without having power source to it. So cost-wise, it was definitely a better fit for this particular project. It also helped us to manage our, again, our emission devices downstream, which had recommendations of having a 200 micron filtration on them, which again is, is if you look at most cut sheets on uh, emission devices, such as your drip lines, your uh, precision rotating nozzles, and your um, rotary heads and spray heads, they have a filtration degree that is recommended for its use. So we typically use that a lot. Okay, so we ended up, uh, Amiad, we recommended the, and F1 Irrigation designed a solution for, that combines quick installation with a reduced footprint and a vandal resistant cage to ensure the filtration system can be protected from vandalism and can discharge into a seepage pit and not distracting from the surrounding landscape. This filtration design is part of the master plan at a large commercial development as we talked about and will continue to be specified on the current and future point of connections to ensure clean water and success with the irrigation systems long term maintenance. So great filter um, and a great case study. So let's just kind of recap again kind of the details here. Um, of what we are thinking process is when we look at a system. And we, we is, as our you know, regional sales manager will go around, we have our basic four or five questions. You know, what is the GPM? What is our pressure? What are we protecting? And what is the water quality? Um, and that kind of answers the questions that are here in a little bit more thinking process. Um, but recognizing the pain, what is the problem? Well, we, we know we've got a water quality problem that we have to deal with. Now we have to diagnose that problem. And we have to go through the different applications of what we're trying to do, meaning what are we trying to protect downstream? What is our success criteria? What are we trying to achieve? And that is, you know, we want to make sure we have beautiful plants and we have irrigation system that doesn't have any defects or problems. Because a clogged nozzle nowadays with how the precision nozzle works, means typically it's harder to clean. And most of the time you end up having to replace them instead of cleaning them. We have to utilize as much water data as we can get. Um, we have to go out and find as much as we can. If we can't get a water uh, analysis done, we need to look in, into what that water quality is uh, based on our best guess. And then we have to consider our site and our end user. What, what's gonna be the long-term maintenance plan for this and how are they gonna take care of that? And then we talk about our technology choice. You know, we go through uh, typically what we wanna see, what's going to be the biggest bang for the buck and what are the strong points? And sometimes what are our limitations? And we weigh out those pros and cons and make the best selection per our site and our end users needs. And then we start talking about sizing and the filter size itself and what filter is going to actually make sense to that. And again, when we ask these four questions, we as uh, filtration experts will probably have three, two to three, if not four different solutions that could and or would be used 
for any particular site. And again, they're going to give you a very similar result in terms of clean water. It's just determining upon whether you want to take a lot of maintenance on that or whether you want to allow it to be self-running or whether you want to you know, have power to it or any of those different factors. So there's a lot to think about in filtration, but it actually can be fairly simple to put it together. And again, this is our thinking process. This is how we put together our uh, plan of attack for any filtration, whether it's a small uh, residential property or a large resident, uh, large golf course. Um, we try to put that process together. And of course, obviously, the smaller the property, the easier the process can be because there's only a few little caveats to that. The bigger the project, there's going to be a little bit more engineering and thought process in that in terms of how it's all put together. So it's definitely a great uh, way to, to go about uh, designing and implementing the filtration in what we do in our industry. So I want to, I know we went pretty quick on that, but I'm hoping we have some questions and we have some dialogue back and forth and uh, we can spend a little time to talk about that. I will go to the next screen, which is basically the final screen that has my contact information on there. Um, if you have any questions or anything you need to know or want to know or understand, don't hesitate to call me. Don't hesitate to email me. Um, we also have RSMs throughout the nation that can help out with filtration and they give you the best recommendations per those sites throughout. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn some time back over to Jake and have him kind of moderate some of the questions and hopefully don't be, don't be shy, ask questions. Let's, let's talk about this. Yes, uh, reminder people, uh, Q&A box, definitely get those questions uh, in as soon as possible so we can get those in. So there, there weren't too many as of yet. Um, I really appreciated the, the clean and concise uh, manner in which we kind of talked about it, you know, going back to just the title of this webinar, filter selection and sizing guidelines. The fact that sizing is at the end, I think is, is one of those uh, tricky ones that they want to pick the right one right at the first, but having that um, understanding and, and finding out what that solution's supposed to be and what we're trying to achieve is is a super, super important step um, that I think a lot of people miss quite a few times. Um, I had a, a really quick question about the water data. You know, you stress about the need to get as much water data as possible. Where, if, if these... Um, designers are starting out or, or I'm a new designer starting out, whatever it is, and you're not familiar with how to go and approach that kind of stuff, where would you suggest starting um, when getting some of that water data? That's a great question. It, that is one of the biggest challenges that we do run into. There are a few facilities around. Um, I know two facilities, and I can't remember the names of them off top, I'd have to look them up, um, that will actually run a quick analysis. And, and when we're looking at this, we're looking at typically just the TSS, the total suspended solids. And we range that on, on the most volume of the micron we're looking to uh, manage. But there are labs that do it, and there's a couple labs that actually, I believe, it's not I know one of them is not too expensive, and then the other ones, the, the one, the other one that I can think of, and again, I'm sorry, I can't pull it off the top of my head here, <laughs> um, that they'll actually do it for free and give you some water analysis. Um, I want to say Weiss, Wisco or something like that. One is is in the central region, and then I'm sure there's locations throughout the nation that I'd have to get back with some of the people on those. Uh, if they want some more specifics on that, I can dig up some information on it and share it with them. Cool. Um, yeah, I think uh, you had a slide in there that did give some general rules of thumb about water uh, mm -hmm. qualities and stuff like that, which is always such a good resource to have uh, just in general. I mean, it gets you close, but I mean, I've, I've been in the industry long enough to know that um, even some of the water that is classified as, call it moderately clean, is way worse than some of the yeah. dirty stuff that I've seen, <laughs> you know, so, so it falls into all kinds of different buckets for sure. 
Well, um, in, a, in a design realm, we will take it and almost take worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're on a project and we're looking at it and we don't have an analysis on the water. We kind of have to design to the worst case scenario to say, unless we've done other projects in the area, if it's a brand new water source and we're guessing, we design to the worst case scenario, which means we almost upsize the filter bigger than it really needs to be. Is, and, that, and that kind of equates to more of a dollar figure, you know, the bigger the filter, the bigger the dollar. So, you know, it, it, and we kind of want to be do that to protect ourselves a little bit. And, and in the design world, a lot of people want to do that as well, which I understand. Um, but it is more advantageous for us to have that, uh, any kind of water data. And, and a lot of the water districts that are providing the water to us, namely recycled water or even pressurized irrigation water, have that data and we can collect that data from them and that actually is another resource that we could use that's probably most cost effective because they generally have to supply that as part of their um providing water yeah yeah and i think that leads into this next question deborah asks um which is a really good <laughs> good lead in is should all sites have some sort of filtration system because a lot of residential clients don't want to spend the money for one so, you know, yeah, uh, it, it, that is a, you know, it's a, it's a number one thought process right now. And, and I remember back probably 15, maybe 20 years ago, they, uh, it was very unheard of to have a filter on a drip zone kit because drip zone kits weren't even a thing. It was, well, I want to add drip to my system. And they started to realize, okay, well, we need regulation to be able to pressurize it down to manage that drip because drip wasn't designed to handle a higher pressure. And then it became commonplace to put a drip zone kit or a filter and regulator. And now if you go out in the world, it's industry standard to put a drip zone kit on anything, even culinary water. Um, so to answer that question, uh, you know, it, it, there's a couple different ways to think about this. And really it's, one of the best ways I've heard it, and it's kind of an odd uh, analysis on it, but if you're to think about this, we buy insurance a lot in this world for various reasons. And a lot of those are for the if and or when it could happen. Um, a filtration on any system, even if it's culinary water, is, a, is almost like that insurance policy. It's a little bit of an expense up front, but it will last for a long, long time. And I've had it in my own home where I didn't have a filter on before my valves. And all I had was my drip zone kit after my valves. And I've had issues with debris getting into my valves. Now we all say, oh, that's culinary water. You're drinking that water. Well, yes, that's true. But anytime the water district or any kind of infrastructure work is done on those piping systems, there's debris that's admitted into that system. That debris could go anywhere. It could end up at any property. And if you're the lucky one that gets that, well, then you're gonna get a stuck or leaky valve, which can cause property damage, property issues, plant loss. So again, it's, it's you know, if you're gonna put it on a residential, let's say they're the ones that are the most challenging to get to buy into it. It's a 30 to $40 part that you put onto a home um, you know, obviously that's based on the scale or the size of the home, a typical tract house, you put it on that and it's, it could be a 30 to $40 install. That's an insurance policy that lasts for a lifetime practically, because, you know, the chances are it's probably not going to have to be cleaned that often unless it's pressurized irrigation or something like that or reclaimed water. But if it's culinary, it, it's probably going to get very, very little in it, but it is going to protect something down the road. And it is to our advantage to have that. For that cost, to me, my gauge is it's worth it. For somebody else, they might say, ah, nah, I'll forget it. Well, they might pay the price, they might not. I mean, it's hard to say, but I would recommend it on most properties just for the simple fact that for us designing it and us doing this type of work, it's in our advantage to have at least listed on there as something recommended. Yeah, and you know, it's hard to, uh 
to say it's always going to be on the city side, even, um, you know, we, in the landscape, we have mainline breaks all the time. Right. And so you're going to get that debris that gets flushed into the zones, clogs the valves, uh, ruins the diaphragms, whatever it is, but, and it's hard to say where you would even put that filtration system to protect the integrity of the whole system, but just in general, yeah. Um, to have that on on the system to catch at least some of it is is definitely worth it in my mind. Um, yeah. So and, and that kind of leads to your point as well with the oversizing of the system, right? It's even if you're not playing worst case scenario and you put it on the site and it's not the right one, it, it falls into the same bucket of what am I losing for that deal? So how right. much is it worth you? you know, putting a larger upsized deal on there that might be overdoing it. Right. But at the same time, you're actually probably protecting it more than than the additional cost that it would be for that. Correct. So, and that's well, and you my give, thought too. You give the capabilities of increase or growth on that site. Um, you know, some sites are pretty restricted and won't probably ever grow any more, but let's say they decide to add a zone back in the North 40 or something, and they now have to bump up the flow and they need to put a pump in or something. And, and you didn't have that upsize side uh, filtration. It would be, then, then you would have to buy another filter. Yeah. That's in. the cost so, of two instead of one. Exactly. A quarter. <laughs> yeah. I I'm in the Definitely. same mindset. So um, I think we have one more question here. Uh, so I guess last call for questions. Um, one more call before we end it here but tom's wondering where we can actually find the pressure loss info for the mini sigmas and that was kind of going to be one of my questions too is um as far as accounting for stuff we're, we're accounting for the flows and the proper microns and stuff like that what should we, we be looking at and how can we find the pressure losses that we should be accounting for for the the actual filters very good question so every filter that we have has a designed criteria to it and a brochure that has all of the flow charts on them and the pressure loss charts on them that will give you the data that's needed based on the water quality. Now, when you look at these flow charts, they're based on a, I believe, an average water. So you kind of have to take some of that into consideration when you get into the very poor water or, and the reason we did average is so that you could kind of take and go between the two and, and factor up or down. And and the pressure loss is really so minimal. It's very hard to, you know, I mean, you design to it a little bit, but we're talking, you know, one to two, maybe three PSI uh, at most. So most of that data is pretty consistent with most of the filters that we sell. So, and that we deal with. And But I have definitely a brochure that has all that data on it that I'd be happy to share with anyone if they wanted just to email me um, and I'll forward it over to them so that they can review it and look at it. But that's a great question. Uh, but we do have all that data calculated and put in together. Cool. Well, um, you know what? I think we've hit our right around 45 minute mark. And I think that's great for this Friday and how it is um, unfolded for us thus far. So guys, thank you so much for joining. Um, oh, just joking. Tom is, uh, he's asking what the minimum flow for the mini Sigma. He's looking at a project where he can't exceed 11 GPM and he can't find the flow for the semi auto mm -hmm. filters. So maybe we can, uh, yeah, connect you. I'd have Tom, Tom, Tom email me direct yeah. and we'll talk about that because there is some things that we would want to go over and some yeah. ways that can manage that perfect. so that you can still utilize that filtration perfect um so tom uh info is right there on the screen go ahead and just jot that down and you guys can talk about that more so anyways yeah thanks again ron um it's great, great information. We love talking about this stuff, educating everybody a little bit more about um, how to spec things, things to think about. And so much appreciated. And Robin, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. And have a great rest of you guys' Friday. Yep. Sounds good. Okay. Bye.